Good evening, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the second of three shows about living history. And what's been really enlightening in the messages I've had since yesterday is some people watching didn't even know what it was or what reenactment was. And I guess that's the nature of the audience I've kind of built up on this channel. We're kind of talking about battles and campaigns and, and aircraft and things like from World War II. And, and I, as a former living historian reenactor, kind of forget some people don't really know what it is and are not familiar with it. But we are going to talk today with professionals from the living history world. So two of whom have also done it as a hobby, one of whom has only done it professionally. So yesterday it was participants. Today it's people who do it and do it publicly and they do it as part of their career or it is their career. So I'm going to bring my guests in. Uh, two I have known fairly recently via this channel and a couple of things. One I have known for nearly or possibly more than 30 years in the case of Mr. Taft Gillingham. So Good evening, uh, ladies and lady and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening everybody. <laughs> so, yeah, well, thanks for being here. So we have, I, I was going to say in my top of the show bit, it would be easier to list the ways you haven't shared history with people than it is to list how you have. Because from spending Christmas in trenches in Belgium to recreating suffragettes, Russian cosmonauts in space, between the three of you, there isn't a medium in which you haven't, been sharing history with people film tv radio book uh stage plays um in front of people at events schools have i missed anything else out <laughs> probably <laughs> so <laughs> there we go so living history reenactment now interesting for about yesterday's show is all four of my guests define when i asked them to define what they were they all came back with reenactor rather than living historian. They, all, they said that the word living historian had, comes with a label of pretentiousness from some people, <laughs> telling that they're something that they're not. And I remember having that discussion with you years ago, Taff, about people calling themselves living history who weren't really living history. But we will get into the labels later on. But to begin with, um, let's go around and how did you get involved in living history and and kind of what do you do so let's start with dr kate vigers first so kate uh, how did you get involved um so for me my degree was in drama and um the royal armories museum had just moved from the tower of london up to leeds which is where i lived and uh i took a punt went for an audition uh ended up getting the job and worked at the royal armories for seven years as one of their historical interpreters um, there I learned to sword fight, hence this ridiculous collection behind me, um, sword fight, horse ride, and brought history to life through drama, so through monologues, a lot of them based on eyewitness accounts. Um, when that all uh, went under, when I was made redundant, I tried to do an office job for a couple of years, didn't like it, so I set up History's Made, which is my own company, and have been doing that ever since. Cool. Um, we'll go to Alex Burnham next. So, um in your case, started as a kind of casual reenact and became professional. So same question. How did you get involved and what do you do? So I started reenacting uh, the American Civil War uh, about 20 odd years ago. Uh, and from that, uh, I moved on to uh, doing other things related to the time period, doing specifically about uh, history of photography at that time. Uh, so I learned how to use the cameras and processes of photography from the Victorian period. And that then led to learning about photography in other situations about the time that the world war one centenaries were going on so i did a lot of stuff about photography in the first world war which led to uh doing things about aerial photography which then led to me doing talks about aerial photography in the first and second world war and it sort of grew from that um to being asked to go to do talks and lectures and you know present things uh, where I then, whilst doing that, I met my sort of current partner in crime, who I now do daft uh, history plays and stories with, which is a completely sort of separate thing to how I started. Brilliant answer. And and Taff, and I think, you know, uh, kind of a bit of a world renowned celebrity, not that the other two of you aren't, but Taff, you know, I mean, you've been involved in some amazing projects over the years. So um, remind us how you, what you, what you, how you started and where you are now. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was all well all, nearly all of it's been accidental really um 
I mean, I'd been collecting stuff. I mean, I, I come from a background of, 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 of collecting rather than living history reenacting. Um, and I'd hardly ever been to, to any reenactment events per se. Um, and every year, a sort of a regular on the calendar was Military Day at Duxford, which was always the first Sunday in August when military vehicles from around the country would gather and they would have a, a, a massive military affair as well. And every year when I went, I would bump into uh, Dickie Ingram, who worked on the stall for Sabre Sales. He worked for Nick Hall. And um, we'd always hit it off and we'd always buy a few bits and pieces and wheel and deal and all that kind of stuff. And then in 1989, he said to me, he said, um, he said, you, you've got the gear, you've clearly got the interest. And, uh, and he said, every year you come here wearing all the gear um, and it's always the right gear and, you, you, and, you, and you've got the shirt on, you've not got a T-shirt under there and all that. Next year, we're off to Dunkirk. It's the, what would have been the 50th anniversary of Dunkirk. He said, and uh, uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of us going over and they're going to drop us at Arm and Tears and we're going to have to stomp 75 miles back to the coast carrying nothing but what they had at the time. Uh, and that sounded like a, a really fascinating idea. And so I joined up with them. I, th I think at the time, I think we all had to be members of the World War II Battle Reenactment Association or whatever. So I joined the BRA uh, really just to go on the trip. And um, and um, and so Colin Wright, who who, who was the organiser, uh, met him and met some fantastic fellas. And by the end of that trip, we'd all had an amazing time. It was brilliant. You, you could take nothing except what the fellas had had at the time, except food and the camera. Um, there were no tents, there were no sleeping bags so at night. Literally, you just had to sleep outside using whatever you'd got. Um, and after a few days in, a, a French fellow turned up and his partner had, uh, she drove a, she drove the car and anything that you decided you didn't want to carry anymore, that went in the car and you'd lost it. So as if you'd just dumped it. So your large pack went in the car, that was your end of your great coat, blankets, anything like that. And you just had a ground sheet. And, um, and I just thought this was incredible because one of the things that had always fascinated me, the very first thing that I can remember buying in the Ipswich Collector's Centre all those years ago was a steel helmet. And suddenly you could reach out and you could touch history. You could pick history up. You could wear history. You could smell it. You could feel it. And that, to me, th this was suddenly a, an extension of that. This was a way of, of, of experiencing stuff that you couldn't learn in any other way. And it's purely selfish. It wasn't for public display or anything like that. Um, and... The following year, Colin's idea was that we were going to go off to Crete and do a similar thing. But right at the uh, last minute, uh, the first Gulf War blew up and the Foreign Office said to Colin, to be honest, if you really want to wander around the Mediterranean dressed as British soldiers with guns that don't work, well, you're on your own. Um, and so Colin knocked that on the head. And right at the last minute, I just happened to see that it was the 75th anniversary of the Battle of the Somme. So I sent a note out to all the guys who'd been to the Dunkirk trip and said, is anyone interested? Um, and I went to see the Great War Society who were down at, uh, I think they, they, they were at uh, Tilbury Fort on one Sunday. Um, and the only one of them who stepped forward was uh, was the late, great Mickey Barnes. Um, and that was our first, first World War trip. And what then went on and became the Khaki Chums, uh, which led on to all sorts of uh, amazing television projects and film projects and theatre and education and all sorts of stuff, working with the army and goodness knows what else. And eventually then in two, when it have been 2001, we set up Khaki Devil um, to provide all uniforms, equipment and weapons and everything for the BBC series, The Trench, um, and have been rolling with that ever since. And, uh, and now uh, in mo more recent times, as a direct result of all of this, has led us to set up, um, well, we're building a First War Museum called Great War Huts, where we're restoring original First War buildings to, uh, I suppose, really take it to the ultimate level. Having done every other aspect, we're literally building a First War Army camp to uh, to display it all. So there you go. Well, fantastic. And another thing that may come up later is that the the late great khaki chums in that you decided to end it uh, because one of the perennial questions about living history in Atman is, when do you stop? Because, you know, you, can yeah. you have 60 year old paratroopers? Can you still have, you know, 75 year old land girls running around at events? And I personally decided to give up. I was 35. Uh, I was a bit fatter than I, what, what I am now. I just said, that's it. I'm going to stop now. And I stopped on a high after Arnhem. And, uh, you know, but that, that's maybe a question for authenticity is how do you overcome that? It came up yesterday that by the time you've got the money to be able to afford to do it these yeah. days, yeah. you're not going to be able to do it at 18. You and I, Taff, we were buying kit when it was 
pocket yeah. money st- price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could yeah. you go to the yeah. pub for the weekend, or you go and come back with a bootload yeah. of gear, and uh, yeah. or both. In fact, as yeah. I did, yes, yes, yeah, occasions. Yeah. So yeah, it's very that's true. You into it, and you know, and you know, as working in a professional environment. So then the next question is going to be, and you've kind of touched on this already, Taff. Is this how does living history connect people with the past that that conventional history doesn't? So, in the, how can a living historian uh, add more to a, uh, the the public or the TV industry or the film crew than just someone who's read the books? So, you know. You've read the books as well. You guys have been to the archives. Kate's done her fantastic book, mm-hmm. Bishop and France, about SOE. So she's been to the same archives as the other people who've done books in SOE have, maybe from a few more in Kate's uh, case. But Kate, you've also worn battle dress. You've also, you know, buggered about with Lysanders and stuff like that. <laughs> so so that extra level of detail, how does that come in? Things? So I'll go to Alex first this time, because you're, you're doing that, these little kind of, I don't want to say skits, because that sounds like it's lesser than it is, because it's a historical playlist. Is that a word? I've made it up now. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I mean, in those things, uh, we often use kit to uh, accent the story, so we'll often put stuff on. Uh, but it's more that's more for colour. But in some of the other stuff I've done before, uh, especially with the uh, photography work I did, there were times where actually doing the process uh, answered a question which otherwise I would never have got. For example, uh, I once uh, was setting up my Victorian uh, camera to take a photo of uh, a couple. uh, And as a modern gentleman, he said to his wife, oh, you sit down, I'll stand behind you and that's how we'll take the photo and she sat down and she was quite short and he was quite tall and all of a sudden that the height difference between them was massive uh with her head down because she was sitting and him him up here and it suddenly struck me that all the victorian pictures the gentleman is sat and then the ladies stood behind but because of the height differences they ended up at a similar level and so for a practical reason Victorian photos were often staged in a way that we would not necessarily think was uh, gentlemanly or something like that. But actually, it was because it made a better photograph. Now, I wouldn't have ever come to that conclusion if I hadn't had to try and arrange these two people for that picture. And so it was a practical sort of uh, experiment uh, that gave me answers. Uh, And the same with um, things like colour especially with Victorian photographs, people are always trying to work out the colour and then colourise the picture uh, that was taken 150 years ago. And I often see people who have tried this and they're making huge, wild assumptions on what colours might have been in the picture based on the black and white image that they see. Uh, And I've been able to prove to myself and to other people how inaccurate it is to try and take a shade of grey and extrapolate some sort of colour from that, because that's not how the chemicals work in that uh, photography. So you can't look at an old Victorian image and go, oh, that's a blue dress, that's a green dress, because the colours are transferred to the photograph differently to how you might imagine they would be. And so there isn't an easy way of going, oh, that's this and that. And so I've been able to use it to, you know, work out actual practical answers to questions that I've had uh, about those topics well that's a perfect answer it makes sense to me that if you had two people who have both studied in your case victorian photography and one has actually been out there and developed pro- photographs using victorian techniques and the other one hasn't the one who has would have an advantage it, it seems natural which and later on folks we will answer the question or ask the question about a perceived prejudice from academia quote unquote against people who dress up as somehow not being as serious as those who don't dress up so i'll go to kate next time and taff you so kate you you you've you know you heard me say about the fact that you know you have played around with lysanders and battle dress and 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 kind of unarmed combat techniques so what do you say to someone who has your your writing of your book how much did your living history background help you with that book it helped a lot um, in terms of things like there's even a footnote in the book which talk, I, I talked about somebody shooting a stun gun and I, I put in the footnote actually I know that this is true because I've shot a stun gun um, and I'm able to tell you what it's like I actually when I shot it um, 
in the shooting range, I took down the ceiling and got in a lot of trouble for it. So, and therefore, I know that the trajectory is what it is. And as a weak and feeble woman, um, I struggled with it. Um, so I, I find that this sort of, I don't know what you call it, experimental archaeology, actually experimenting, using the stuff that you're talking about or um, are writing about makes a real, real difference. And it brings it to life. I, th I suppose because I've got a background in drama as well. Um, the way that I view what I do is sort of bringing history to life through performance. So a lot of my talks, unlike what Alex is currently doing with um, History Tellers, which is absolutely brilliant, um, I'm out there in the uniform, sometimes on a horse, sometimes on foot, whatever it is, trying to use eyewitness accounts to bring those stories to life. And I find that really important, yeah, like that. Um, I've got a microphone on there and I'm talking uh, and performing as first aid nursing yeomanry. So um, I've got the, you've raided my Facebook, haven't you, Paul? I have. I've been on your <laughs> Facebook page, yeah. <laughs> um, and I just find it really important to be able to tell these people stories and to give a voice to them because you can read, um, oh, that was so naughty. Uh, I thought I was going to get arrested for this one because you're not <laughs> supposed to impersonate a Chelsea pensioner. And oh. that uniform, of course, is what they were based on. And I walked into the Chelsea pensioners hospital uh, dressed like that. <laughs> um but yeah, I find it really important to give these voices. And to me, you know, if I'm at a show and somebody says, why do you do this? It's like, if for 10 minutes of your life, I can take you out of yourself and introduce you to a bit of history you'd never considered, you'd never heard of, um, you, you've never participated in. And just for these 10 minutes, you're hearing the voice of an SOE agent. So my, my interest in SOE started with a performance and I wrote it based on interviews and eyewitness accounts. Uh, and it's the the one I still perform today is, you know, still based on eyewitness accounts and is a real person's voice. They're always composite. I never say I'm one person or another. But I just think it's really nice to be able to do that and to bring to the public something that they've never heard of before. So that's sort of where I'm at with it. And to wear the right stuff, um, to get the uniforms correct, to get the, the battle dress correct. So to know what it's like to be a woman wearing a battle dress that was designed for a man or when I do the first aid nursing yeomanry first world war or pre-first world war learning to ride in all that stuff that they had to carry and those ridiculous culottes it's it's a real challenge and you you understand it so much more by doing it no definitely perfect answer to that and and Taff in, in your case you, you, in recent years you've been doing it more in the professional with the film tv play environment you know having as we said khaki chums kind of kind of slipped you know in the past now so but but we talk about when the a historical movie is made there are there's a wardrobe person there's a props master there might be someone third assistant director in charge of crowd control and someone also behind the scenes giving historical advice you quite often have been all four of those things and probably other things as well in the same place so in terms of how what what do you bring having worn the kit own the kit handle the kit that a regular military historian can't bring to that kind of environment okay um yeah it's something that uh, when people ask the question i say well if, if you read like so many of the, the most famous accounts of I don't know, first war for instance uh, people like john lucy there's a devil in the drum or frank richards old soldiers never die when they talk about marching down the road their feet are stinging on the cobbled stones the clank of the mess tins the smell of the wet surge anybody reading that has to imagine it but the chums don't. The khaki chums can can hear it. They can smell it. They can feel it. They 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 literally experienced it. And so that's just one tiny fragment. And the, the place where I really where when I realised that 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 the knowledge and the experience we'd got was something that was that was that was really worth it um, was back in 1999. The chums went to Holland with the, the veterans of the Suffolk Regiment, First Battalion Suffolk Regiment, were on a battlefield tour. And Brigadier Della said to me, can two of you come on the coach with us? Um, because it would it would be wonderful to have two of you in all a kit to spark the old boys' memories. And I said, well, that's a lovely idea, Brigadier. We're not going to do that. We're going to bring a 1500 weight truck and a whole load of us will come and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll tag along. We'll, we'll join you at certain points. We're going to find fields to dig slip trenches in at night and all that sort of stuff. Um, and towards the end of the trip, we um, we went to the cemetery at Venray. 
And we got there early, as you know, anyone that's owned a 1500 weight truck knows you have to get everywhere early because it'll only do 38 miles an hour. And so we're there. <laughs> exactly. So we get there first thing in the morning. The old thing's sat on the curb. It's got two wheels up on the grass. There's blokes cooking breakfast. Uh, Jack Johnson's cooking breakfast. Uh, everybody else is washing and shaving. There's fellas cleaning the rifles. And, and the one thing that everybody had said to me before we went, when I spoke to the veterans, what's your lasting memory of the campaign in the Low Country? What do you remember above all else? And they were, we were tired. We were always tired. All of the time we were tired. And so, right, we all, I need to find a way of making them tired. So I'd engineered it so that we, we, we got on the ferry. We landed um, we landed at the Hook of Holland something like midnight or one o'clock in the morning, drove all the way to the south of Holland, um, all the way down, down to Weir to wherever we, we, we started. So and, and nobody got any sleep. So they're already uh, uh, tired f- from the start. They're already grouchy, and that doesn't improve over the next few days. And so there they all are. They're washing their shave. They're all sort of, you know, tired and, and, and grumpy and all this sort of stuff. And as I'm standing there eating my, my breakfast, through the middle of all this, I can see a, a Dutch woman and her husband who've arrived early for the service. And she's walking through the middle of it. And she's like, my goodness, this, this is incredible. I said, what's the matter? You're right. She said, I was a 14 year old girl when we were liberated by the Canadians. She said, they look just like this. And there's Bob Steadman, you know, literally, you know, bleary eyed, absolutely minging, filthy, dirty. And she said, and that smell. And that smell of rifle oil, hexamine cookers, old army lorries, stinky bodies, sweat and, and damp surge. That smell had picked that lady up and it had transported her 65 years back in time in an instant. And in that moment, I completely got the fact that there was something different about what we do. There's something important about it. There's something that you can learn that you could never, ever learn in a book. And since that time, all of it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky because I'm like a sponge. I don't know where it comes from, but it, it goes in and it stays in. So a director can turn to me and go, Taff, what was the weather like on the morning of the first day of the Battle of the Somme? Oh, it was this. Uh, and, and just as importantly, if I don't know the answer, I say, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find it. Just give me a minute. Um, because there's an awful lot of people that just make stuff up rather than be seen to not know, uh, which is a dreadful thing to do. But that ability to be able to fish back into your mind Think about stuff you've done, places you've been, things you've seen. As Kate said, weapons you've handled, weapons you've fired, the weight of the stuff, uh, the sleeping outside at night, the, the fact your matches are damp, you can't get your Tommy Cooker gang in the morning. All of that stuff goes in. And, and of course, we were lucky. We, we got to speak to a lot of veterans of both world wars and all of their stories. And also, <laughs> you were also able to filter out the stuff that was complete fantasy because there's plenty of those, bless them, uh, as people that have picked stuff up along the way. But but you could filter out and you could add to those bits. You you could pick all that knowledge up. So now when we when we when we're working on a job, people can ring up. Well, how did this work? Why did that work? Uh, how did they do this? How did they do that? What do they carry in this pocket? And and again, that was the other thing that that when a lot of people were interviewing veterans, what did you do during the Battle of the Somme? I don't know. I just did as I was told, you know, but I used to say to him, what did you carry in this pocket? What did you got in your back pocket? What had you got in your wallet? What, what, because that was the stuff that interested me. So now that's the stuff that pays back big dividends because, you know, I, <laughs> I can just recall it all and, and pass that on. And it's it's been a really, really, really useful thing to do. And because the Khaki Chums covered that whole period from the Boer War till the end of national service, it was quite a wide period. And some people used to say, well, that's a mad period. But but as far as we were concerned, in 1899, there were British soldiers in khaki uniforms firing 303 bullets from the Enfield rifles. By 1959, there are still just khaki uniforms, 303 bullets, Lee Enfield rifles. In the meantime, there's been two catastrophic world wars and the nuclear age has arrived. But what it is, it's a period of history that you can pick up and you can look at from end to end and you can see that evolution. So it, that that was the reason we cover that period. But what it means is that we we can see we, we have context, if you like. So so it's not just I've studied this bit or I've read these books or I've done this bit or I've studied this in infinite detail. We we get the fact that the British Army of 1914 is as good as it is because of what had happened in South Africa 12 years earlier and can add that in and put that into the context, which helps. It helps all the time with what we do now. It's connecting the dots and adding depth, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you, you worked on Journey's End famously. So they, if they'd employed someone who knew 
the history of a regiment. So they they could do what you can do, but that was all they could do. So they could say, okay, I know where they were on this date. I know where they were there. But maybe the director wanted to create a scene where two of his characters are having a discussion in the dugout and he pulls something out. You can add that. Well, he, that's where he would keep that, in that pocket. He would have had that behind that. You could have the letter folded up in a something or other. You could do this. The cigarette there, the, 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 the bully beef there, you can add a layer of depth that allows the director to then add another level of, of depth to his performance, to the, to, the, to the actors, to create a level of, of authenticity to a scene that's way beyond just the right helmet or the right the, the yeah. right pattern of sandbag. And that's that level of, of de depth, I think, that a living historian can bring. And um, so, you know, with, with your various skills and bringing things there, so that's that's the best of what living history can do. It's it's an all senses thing. And that'll come on to later on. We've got point four to do about, and you touched on all three of you have touched on it. It's about all the senses. You know, Alex working there with his chemicals, a photo. You know, there's a there's a smell. There's there's a there's a, there's the the texture. And Kate there with swords. And there's the noise of swords hitting. If you're in a museum seeing a sword in a cabinet, you can't hear metal against metal. The the, the a, a, a sweaty horse running in front of you is different to seeing a horse mannequin in a museum. All those types of things. So, um. We will touch on that sensory side of things later. The next question I think is that I really want to bring up, and this is the prejudice. We touched on it earlier on about this idea that as a living historian, you're maybe not seen the same way as a professional historian, although as we've already established, you guys all are professional historians by the fact you earn a living from it. So we'll go to Kate this time because you said something to me in the email. You don't have to share what you said in the email, but I want to go to Kate because you you are aware of multiple hats. And I mean that literally and figuratively. You do wear lots of different hats for your job, but you also have different jobs because you're an author, you're a doctor you, you of history. You know, So um, do, do you want to share about the, any kind of prejudice you've received and, and, the, and the wearing of different hats? You're a living historian, but also you're an author and you're a doctor. Yes. So, yeah, uh, I'm all of those things. Um, I have a PhD in history, as you said. Uh, the book Mission France um, really came about through this. If I hadn't been a historical interpreter, I would never have discovered SOE and gone on to that. But there is a massive prejudice. Um, I find it in lots of different ways, uh, and I'm sorry to bring this into it, but being a female historian, um, I really do find that um, I struggle sometimes to have my voice heard or to be taken seriously. I know when I started writing the book and someone said, oh, God, another woman writing about women, and I thought, terrific, thanks for that. And and the other weird thing is getting um, um asked to do something purely because you are a woman so i'm currently on a netflix program um called world war ii uh, i think it's world war ii in color and they wanted me to talk about tanks because they needed a woman to to talk about tanks and i'm suddenly going off learning about the battle of kursk so that's one element of it but the other element of it is being you know people think we dress up they don't see the research the the trogging through archives and looking for the right uniforms, the right kit, the right stories to tell. People don't see all of that stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Now, you see it in a book and you're well aware I did that research in a book. And I remember somebody once I did a talk on the history of tea and someone said, my God, she's got a good imagination. I thought, how condescending. Everything I told you was true uh, just because you don't want to believe it because I'm sitting right here in a Regency dress, for example. Um, but yeah, what we talked about on the email call was um, that because I work in academic circles, because I talk and speak in, in quite high social circles these days. I was at a very posh club in London last week uh, speaking about the book and somebody said, well, what, what else do you do for a living? And I thought, do I try and explain? Do I do I say that I'm an actress who works at heritage sites that does all these things or what do I do? And when I did say it, there was a real air of, oh, bless you. Oh, you know, she plays Queen Victoria. Isn't that lovely? And I thought, God damn it. You don't see everything that goes on behind all the, like I've, I've just said it all, all that research, all that effort, all the stuffing about that goes on behind the scenes. And I, I'm sure a couple of, you know, the other guys are going to agree with me when people say you're living the dream. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not quite that simple. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And I think I'm very fortunate in that I bring both of my academic studies to the fore. First degree is drama, second one in, in history. And I marry the two and I sort of push them forwards. 
but yeah there, there's that real prejudice there's that real almost do I dare say it do I dare admit you know that right behind me now there's a parasol and a crinoline as well as a book what I authored yeah it's it's I mean, weird one. very weird it makes one. no sense because we live in a society where we revere actors. We, we revere people who appear in films or on stage. We think they're, you know, mm. and we listen to what they say about politics or sport, or whatever. And we revere academic historians to some, if, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're a doctor and you read, some of you guys, you're both of those things. I mean, so mm. you should at least have equal credibility and possibly more credibility. But, you know, I've had these conversations on and off with Taff over the years, you know, because Taff and I, sim I have no qualifications whatsoever for what I do, except I've been doing it for a long time. It's kind of, you do it long enough, you kind of get some unofficial badge from something. But I have no qualifications. I get I get emails saying I shouldn't be doing it, and I'm a fraud, I'm a fake, and, and PhD people should do this. And I've had people, I've had some anonymous people have even emailed some guests I've had and tell them they shouldn't be appearing on my show because I'm a I'm a wannabe, and you know, um, and and in some ways they're right because I'm not a proper historian by by what standards. So, Alex, let's turn to you about potential prejudice. Um, you know, you you've written books, you've appeared as uh, you've you've let, you've spoken at, at festivals and things like that. Outside of your history tellers thing, you've actually been there in the in the tie wearing pre presenting thing. So, prejudice as regards to being someone who just dresses up. Um, Share it. Share more. Uh, yeah, I I have experienced a bit of it. Certainly with the history tellers, um, we perform at places like the Chalk Valley History Festival, uh, and because we're seen as sort of the uh, the light entertainment, uh, some of the uh, bigger names look down on us a bit. But then we're getting audiences of hundreds of people coming and watching our show and learning from it in a fun way. Whereas lots of these talks are getting 20 people who sit there nodding sagely and are bored mostly. And uh, I think the prejudice is, is certainly there, but possibly some of it is because um, not all reenactors or living historians are very good. And so finding the, the, the good ones and sort of separating that from the, the less good stuff can sometimes... I think people are very quick to dismiss, uh, you know, oh, reenactors, uh, like you said before, sometimes you get 80-year-old um, uh, overweight paratroopers and it, 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 it instantly sort of tars the reenactment as a whole because not all people are doing it as well as it could be done or whatever you want to sort of judge that by. And so I think um, people who've studied at a university will look at that as a, a people playing it it's just a hobby it's not serious um whereas some of us are taking it seriously and doing our the very best we can to do things correctly to have the the correct equipment to you know follow the correct procedures or whatever the situation is um and so it is very you know disheartening we we did a history tellers show a few years ago at the chalk valley and there happened to be somebody talking about the exact same subject who'd written a book uh, and we went and we we spent a bit of time watching his pr presentation and he sort of walked past us whilst we were doing the same story and you'd have thought out of you know just idle curiosity they might stop and watch and find out but they sort of shook their head and wandered off in a in a well, pity the fools type manner uh, and we took it quite harsh because we thought well we're putting a lot of effort in to get these stories across not only with facts and uh, all the history that you know, need to get in there, but also in a way that is entertaining and uh, attractive to a wide variety of people. Uh, and you think there's an awful lot of proper historians who write a book which is almost you know, impossible to get through because it's long and dull and waffly. Uh, whereas people like ourselves and Kate, who are squeezing a huge amount of in entertainment and history out of a half an hour show, um, we should really be seen as the, the the same job, just a different end of the spectrum, perhaps. But it's it's not usually um, seen in the same way. Uh, and I don't really sort of um, don't have any answers to that, to be honest. It's just sort of something we've uh, we have to accept and move on from, it seems. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, the, the people who I know in the conventional history world, some of them have been on my guests on, sh on my show and on Twitter and things like that, who just don't like living, don't like the whole concept of dressing up. 
these people are, are also able to take on board that there are good books about history and bad books about history. So why can't they understand there's a good end of reenactment and there's a bad end of reenactment? And there's nothing, we talked about this last night, there's nothing we can do about the crap reenactment. There's nothing we can do about the people just go and buy stuff and cheap stuff and dress you know, straight out of the packet and go and walk around at war and peace. We can't do anything about that. We can't do anything about the fat paras and the, but, but why can't they treat the spectrums, the, the different ends of the spectrum differently? I don't understand that. And I no, don't well, understand. And, and like enough, enough. A, a few years ago, I did a, uh, an American civil war march, similar to how Taff was saying, sort of marching through Europe, but we, we covered sort of 20 odd miles on the, the hottest day of the year recreating a, a, an American Civil War unit which had marched into Gettysburg, which again was a very hot day of the year when the battle happened. And the amount that we got from that by, you know, carrying our kit and sleeping in the cold and marching in the heat and all the rest of it. Um, I learned more from that sort of weekend of activity than an awful lot of the books I've ever read, because half of these books are covering the same ground. They talk about the same things or are just, you know, sort of rehashing what's gone before. There's not always the new and useful information in there um and so it was hugely you know impressive but then on well, my sort of my own understanding but then you also go along to a, a reenactment of any time period and you see people who uh, are not you know sleeping in the cold and are not wearing the full kit and are not doing things they're just sort of uh, playing at it and that's fine if that's their hobby and interest so i'm not going to stop them doing it but it's it's not going to be as educational perhaps and maybe like you said people need to just sort of be able to understand the the, the good from the bad however who decides the good from the bad i suppose is a harder a question to you know find that person who can sit there and uh judge what we're all doing maybe we can't uh, we can't easily quantify what is good and what is bad but we can definitely try and persuade people to accept that there is a good and a bad I think that would be if I can achieve one thing with this is some of the I mean, yesterday I had a couple of my academic -y kind of friends who aren't anti reenactment, but they're a bit arms folded and kind of, you know, a bit unsure about it. And and they they took on board what we said and, and were really interested by it. So, yeah, how where you draw the line with standards, that's the, that's a, that's an endless debate. At what point are you too old to wear a uniform? At what point are you too large in the middle to wear a uniform? At what point you know, those they're very, very difficult to answer those questions, you know. Um, but but what we can do is say that is address the fact that there is a good end and a bad end. But Taff, let's bring up the subject with you in terms of prejudice. You know, you're just a guy who dresses up. You're just a guy who gives out bits of khaki to people. You're not a proper historian. What's your, what's your comeback to that? Okay, so just really quickly, two things. First of all, your thing earlier about not being a proper historian. You know, the, the funny thing is that the argument rages week after week on social media with historians tearing chunks out of one another. Oh, you're not a proper historian. Oh, you're not a proper historian. Oh, I'm not a proper historian. Oh, I feel guilty because I don't feel like a proper historian. And you just like, get, get, get yourselves a dictionary. See what it says about a historian. See what it tells you a historian is. Because you, all of you, are historians. You just are. And what you might not be, you might not be, apart from Kate, you might not be academic historians, which is a very different thing. And I don't pretend to be an academic historian. I mean, you were saying earlier, you don't have any qualifications, Woody. Neither do I. And that was a deliberate decision. And the reason that, I mean, dear old Professor Pete Simpkins, who was a, a dear, very dear friend of mine, um, I used to take him to all our Suffolk Western Front Association meetings. And he regularly used to say to me when I first knew him, you know, Taff, you, you know, you, why don't you, you know, you really ought to get a degree. You really ought to. And I said, but the thing is, Pete, at the moment, we all appear on the same television programs. And in those days, it was Professor Peter Simpkins. It was Dr. Gary Sheffield and the bloke at the end. And what it meant was that everybody can have an opinion that's worth listening to if they can do their homework mm. and study. And it didn't matter. You didn't need to be in some specific point in an academic ladder to have an opinion that was worth listening to and to me that was worth far more than getting yourself pigeonholed in some particular slot that says oh you know dr gillingham or professor gillingham or professor emeritus gillingham. It, it doesn't matter do you know what you're talking about yes or no and there are plenty of people with qualifications who literally have not a clue what they're talking about and talk utter nonsense we see it every day Likewise, there are plenty of people who don't know what they're talking about who are not qualified in anything. But the, the point is that, that, that 
everybody who can be bothered to study, everybody that's got something worth saying should have the right to say it. And the whole thing about uh, about the, 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 the people wearing kit, you, you know, it, it does come back to the fact that it's quality control. And in a way, the age thing doesn't bother me as much as the ability to wear it properly. It genuinely doesn't matter if you're 70, as long as you don't really look 70, as long as you know how to wear it. But there are blokes who are 18 who, who are 20 who are 25 or 30 who, who as you've said, buy the stuff just because it's now cheap and easy to get and put it on without a clue how to wear it properly. And then don't know how to do the drills and don't, don't know how to carry the weapons and, and even groups that, that, that carry the weapons, you know, period weapons in modern styles. And you think, start with it. That's the starting point. If you sort all of that out and if you look like you know what you're doing, if you can achieve a decent standard of uniformity, of equipment, of drills, and you actually look sharp enough, it doesn't really matter if you've got a couple of old timers in there as long as the balance is right. But the problem for so many groups is that, and it's it, it's not their fault because they've come at it by going to a multi-period event and thinking, oh, I fancy a change. Let's just change the outfit and do something a bit different. Whereas I think that we were very lucky that the khaki chums came at it from a different approach. Nearly all of us originally were collectors. And because we were collectors, we were interested in the detail, the nitty gritty. And that then led on to, right, well, where's the manual? Who's got the manual? Who's got, how do we do the drill? Who knows the drill? Oh, none of us know the drill. Well, someone's going to have to learn it and teach the others. And it all sort of led on from that. So the fact is, as you've already established, there will never be a time when you can regulate it. There will never be a time when you can police it. But there is the ability for some groups to be far better than the others. And, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that that even now, even even several years after we wound up, the chums still have a reputation because we left on a high. And all those people who over the years who were members still are respected for what they did. And there are people that come along behind that are doing great work. The, the Royal Warwick Bunch, the, the, you know, the standard that they're doing for Boer War and First World War is superb. It, it really is. So it's, it's possible to do it. But what you need is people in those groups who can be bothered to drag the stuff up to a level where it needs to be and and that would that would certainly make it easier uh, to to sell the idea to people who are skeptical but let's be honest about it there will always be people that just think yeah well you're just idiots who dress up i on the other hand have spent ages researching stuff in, in, in an archive uh, therefore i'm clearly you know I, I clearly know much more than everybody else and we know that that's not true we know that there is a place for everybody. We know that the that that, that the standard of, of of knowledge, you know, there's no guarantee that you that that just because you've read something, you've interpreted it properly. I mean, back in 2014, when the First World Centenary kicked off, the BBC were publishing these little sort of guides on various aspects of the First World War. The one on trench routine was utter nonsense. They'd, they'd literally got the trench routine upside down. They said, oh, everybody, you know, the, I mean, in reality, throughout most of the war, the fellas sleep through the day when it's dangerous and work at night when it's safer. And they got it the wrong way around. And I said, I think Dan Snow had been working. I said to Dan, can you have a word with these guys? And, and they're, oh, no, 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 no. Our academic historian tells us this is right. Well, your academic historian is talking utter nonsense, whoever it is. And that's a problem that the, well, if he's academic, it must be right. Well, no, no. The evidence, and, and we were sending him the evidence. Here's the trench routines. Here's trench routine manuals, six or seven of them. No, our, our academic says that this is right. All right, tell you what. And wh what can you do? <laughs> yeah, and the interesting thing is, and we got, we'll bring Kate and Alex's. I, said, so I was one of those academics, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't do trench it, routine. It's all her fault. <laughs> You're in a different area of the country. I was doing Yorkshire. <laughs> but where did a a dislike or distrust or or a negative view of living history reenactment come from within academia? Who was some was someone in academics bitten by a reenactor fifty years ago? Was there some bad experience somewhere where someone was you know? Because I don't understand where it comes from, I, I, and I don't understand why why it perseveres, especially in this environment now of of museums, everybody working on this broad multi-dimensional multi-sensory application of, of history to, to museums with holograms and and smells things like that. living history history has all of that and has been doing that for years so 
Has anyone got any idea where it came from? Where did this this distrust in living history come from within academia? I think um, when reenactment started, whenever it did start, um, it was pretty hit or miss. Um, I, so I, I said at the beginning, I used to work at the Royal Armouries and um, the live interpretation department was was born from something called the Medieval Society. And it took took its influence from that. And that took its influence from Errol Flynn films. So I think at, in some ways, and, and it's all developed now, you know, I know we're not talking about medieval, but the way that medieval has developed in terms of reenactment and authenticity and armor and everything is now second to none. But I think it all started with a bit of a, let's have a bit of a go and try and work it out. And it, it didn't necessarily go the right way. There's lots of nylon, lots of, um, you know, <laughs> men in tights, lots of things that weren't correct. And I, I think with the English Civil War as well, the um, there was a real element of let's give it a go. And you still get it in reenactment now. You know, I'll look great until you get to my feet and I'm wearing trainers. Um, one of the things I hate as a female historian or, or living historian is women who don't bother doing their hair, getting their shoes right, getting their outline correct. Um, and I think that's where the reputation has come, is that people try and cut corners. They try and, um, I don't know what the word is, they, they dilute it. And I wonder if that's where it's come from. And now there's a real move in the last 20, 30 years to get it right. Has the damage already been done in, in some respects with the, the men in tights? Has it already sort of um, destroyed the reputation before it even got there? That makes a lot of sense. And, and Phil, Phil Blood, Dr. Phil Blood is watching, saying he might have to make some uh, statement about academics because we must be clear, not all academics are against living history. We're, we're talking about the subset that don't. And there's lots of cross-pollination. There are people in museums and there are academics who love living history and reenactment and there are those that don't. So we, we mustn't tar them all with the same brush any more than they are tarring. The point we're making is they're tiring reenactors with the same brush, so we mustn't do the same thing back there. But, I, um, I was going to sort of uh, jump in with the same point that we've worked with uh, Dan Snow and uh, James Holland in particular, really sort of pro reenactors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so some, I think, really get that there is something to be learned from this. But I completely agree with what Kate said, maybe not just the men in tights, but in general, that the lower quality of reenacting tends to, to drag down all reenacting and then let living historian and whatever you want to call it with it um whereas like you said uh, earlier paul that the the lower end of books doesn't tend to pull down all academic books with it so there just seems to be a sort of a uh, two double standard sort of thing as to um, who is seen as a valid source on this particular sort of uh, topic yeah, and, and uh, well put. And Brad, Brad from on this day in Canadian history is saying that he know, has heard lots of academics who are against it and can speak on why there's lots of them against it. So that's one of the ideas I want to do for another programme is kind of a rebuttal, really, is bring four three or four academics on and let them tell me why they don't like it. What 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 is it they've got? Were they bitten as a child by a reenactor? Is that where it stems from? You know, did, did, did a reenactor you know, send you a not, not date you when you were 12 at school or so. I don't know. But I mean, I'm going to apply to fancy now. But um, sorry, I, I moved you, Taff. Hang on, Taff. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah. I mean, I have to say that um, that the khaki chums never saw themselves as reenactors or living historians. I mean, the, the, the chums were a selfish bunch who um, who spent 30 years going across to France and Belgium. And they hardly ever did a, a any sort of living history events here. If we did, it was only ever to raise money. Uh, and it was a learning thing. It was a learning thing for us. Um, and and through a lot of that period, deliberately distanced ourselves from a lot of other groups for, for that very reason. I mean, to be honest, in the early days that the Great War Society had very high standards quite early on. So 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 that day often came on tours with us. Um, certainly the Durham Light Infantry guys, uh, you know, Case fellow Phil uh, and, and Rob and the other DLI chaps. Um, but by the time we'd got to the to the centenary, the khaki chums did one event in in 2014. Uh, we did the big mobilisation of, of the army uh, from Waterloo Station to Southampton. Um, we did uh, something for the uh, for the Somme anniversary up at Manchester in 2016, which was quite small scale. Um, and then we did a final a final tour to the uh, to the tank drome at Aran um, in, in in 2018, and that was it. And one of the reasons 
was because there were so many really bad groups that had turned up and we it just we just didn't we were very keen not to be associated with the overall dropping of standards it's interesting the point kate makes that when you look back to the 60s and the early 70s how uh, the sealed knot and others were sort of getting off the ground using anything that they could find it's almost like sort of uh, saucepans and colanders for helmets and then the standard raises and we'd seen that obviously again with the first war stuff in the early days nobody made repro so it was all converted it was converted 49 pattern battle dress trousers it was it was the uh, 20s tunics it, it was webbing that you'd managed to cobble together or adapt but then you reached a stage where decent stuff started to be made. And, and, and most oaks of, of the chums, I always said, he said, the day you can buy all of it off the shelf, the standard will plummet because nobody will know how to wear it properly. And it will just be, you know, and, and that's pretty much what happened. So, again, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I absolutely wouldn't give a wouldn't give a pass right across the board. Um, and, and again, I suppose in a way, it's just because what we did was different. I mean, I think that. Corelli Barnett once said said to me, he said, what, what, what's fascinating about, about the Khaki Chums is that actually what you are is a huge knowledge resource base. And that's really what the Chums were. The, amongst the Chums, there was authors, there were historians, there were collectors, all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff from period packaging to weapons, uh, specialists in drill, all sorts of stuff. So so in a way, it was it was kind of different. Um, and maybe that's what what led on to the to the path that, to, that some of us ended up on. Um, so so I get the fact that that. It's not about it. it, it you, you you can't say well well I can understand why all academics think this or that because there is no all of anything. There's no reenactors aren't all in one box. Academics aren't in another. I mean a lot. I've got a lot of great academic mates who completely get it. People like Pete Simpkins completely understood what we did and why we did it. Uh, in fact, I think one thing that was really interesting when we made the TV series The Trench 21 years ago, where we took 25 fellas from Hull and trained them as first war soldiers and took them to France for a week, uh, for a week, for a month, I think it was about five weeks in the end. Afterwards, Pete Simkin said to me, he said, it strikes me that the people that got most out of that were those of you that took part. And I think that that's the truth, that in a way, if you stand on the outside and look at it, it it's not obvious what you get out of it. It's the doing it. It's That's the way you understand it. And, and, and I, I think that, it, you know, I, I could easily see why people are going, well, how on earth can you have a better understanding of of the 24th division in 1917 because i've read all the war diaries i know much more about them how can you possibly have anything of any value to add well you know it, it's because we've literally come at it from two totally different directions but both are valid uh, yeah. and, and both have something to add uh, but i'm also perfectly well aware that there are people who thoroughly enjoy going out on a sunday sitting in a field drinking tea talking to people about lewis guns who who really don't have much to add. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you made a good point there, Taff, about the about the the wanting it, you know, the, the passion for it. You you want you want to sit in <laughs> holes in Belgium. You wanted to be out there doing this stuff. And Kate Alex as well. And you know, the living history that I forget where Mag and I were. We were somewhere where there was a museum where they were employing people to wear uniforms. And obviously well, obviously, I'm assuming the guys who went out and did that, they were working in the in the gift shop in the morning, and then they were put they put the uniform to do whatever it was for two hours, and they go back in the gift shop again. And the gear was all right; they didn't know how to wear it, and why should they care about wearing it properly? Yeah. Why would they care about right, not having the right underwear on? Because it's just they're probably on a you know minimum wage. It's just a job they're doing for the summer. So that kind of living, like the tights thing that Kate brought up, why should that living history be be anything particularly good? It's not. It, it, you get what you pay for in a sense, isn't it? Whereas you got, you know, again, going back to film work and consultancy work, if you're there giving advice to actors on set, you've actually worn the gear. You've actually, you know, you, you can take them, take them, you know, you'll feel that after a while, mate, you know, after five hours in those boots, you really will feel it. You won't have to act about your feet. Yeah. Hurting because your feet genuinely will hurt. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think that that's, that's a really important point that the, I, I think that the, the the one thing that I think always makes a difference is is when you're advising on stuff, when you're involved right from the outset. So right at the outset, you work with them on the script. Uh, so you, you and if you work on it from the right from the start, you correct most of the errors before they've been made. You see the stuff in the script. You know this is going to be a problem. You go look. 
you know, this is the wrong way around. You need to change the dialogue or actually this sign that you've got outside this company headquarters. It's not right. If you make it the right, if that's all done in the script, by the time it reaches the art department, they'll make the right sign. If, if, if you if you're saying that this this officer's rank is wrong, he needs to be a major, he's not a colonel, then the costume department will find the right costume. You, then you can have a quiet word with costume and say, actually, um, he shouldn't have that insignia on he's a staff officer he needs to have tabs and actually there won't be red tabs they'll be blue because he's an engineer and all of these little bits of detail that you can add right at the outset and in fact some of the best stuff i've worked on is where i've literally been like the third or fourth person who's been taken on before the costume designer before the makeup artist before the art department and so you can really make a difference then you work with all of those department heads uh, obviously there's creativity along the way but but to me that the role isn't in, in, a lot of people see the role of historical advisor as telling someone why they can't make the film they want to make. And it isn't that at all. It's saying, OK, look, you really can't do that because it's utter nonsense. But I get the fact that you're trying to make a drama. My job isn't to stop you. It's to say, look, you can't do that because it's nonsense. But how about you do this, which means you can still do the same thing, but not in that way. And that's the thing. It's all about finding a solution to their problem, not just giving them a problem and walking away. And that comes down to years and years of absorbing information of of knowledge of drills of, of, of ammunition boxes it's it there's so much to it uh, i mean i regularly get people sending me messages going oh i've decided to become a historical advisor where do i start i said well like 40 years ago would be a help um because there is just so much that you need to be able to take on board because you never know what they're about to turn to you and ask but so much of it is down to stuff that we've just absorbed. A lot of it's common sense as well. I mean, that's the other thing you say, oh, what would a soldier do in this instance? You say, well, what would you do? They, well, they're just human, they're like you. In this instance, they would do exactly what you would. Oh, right, okay. But anywhere where there's specific drills or specific insignia or certain weapons or way that weapons are handled, all of that stuff you know, is it, stuff that you can bring to the party and you can improve the breed. The people that drive me nuts, and there are tons of them, and many of them will be watching this right now. The people go, oh, it's only a film. Oh, it's only drama. It doesn't matter. And you could argue that. But there are people who are paid far more money than you are to get it right. And a lot of the time they don't get it right because this week they're doing a First War film. Next week they'll be doing something from the 50s. A week after that they'll be doing something Victorian. They don't have the capacity to get all that right. They need advice. They need decent advice. They need to ask the right people. I mean. You know, 1917 is a great example. In nearly every frame, there's an error, an avoidable error. A lot of it because they're holding weapons the wrong way, stuff like that. And it's just daft because it could be right. It wouldn't cost any more to do it properly. And it's it's that sort of stuff that can be avoided. And, and why on earth wouldn't you get it right if it doesn't make any difference whether it's right or wrong? And that's 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 what we set up Karki Devil for. We just thought at the end of the day, you know, we are two of the people, Kev Smith and I, that would sit there going, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong, they've got that wrong. And people used to say, well, if you're so bloody clever, why don't you do it? All right, then we will. Mm. Yeah, no, it's that, it, you know, we've, we've all, every one of us and all the people watching this have all had those conversations. At what point do you switch off your brain when you're watching a film? What point do you switch on the historian? And, you know, I'm going to try and enjoy this for what it is. Ah, oh, yeah, but that, the, the, beret wearing i think is the thing that probably more than anything else annoys me more because it's just you see it as being wrong immediately you might not notice a wrong collar dog or something i bet for a little bit because you have to freeze for a bit a, 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 a pudding on a hair like it's just, you notice it immediately and you can't shake it but anyway um i want to move on to the next point which is about we've already touched on it it's that multi-sensory aspect of of, of what living history reenactment brings because you know, Taff, you talked about your 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 Great War Huts project, and we'll come back to it in a minute. Because sure, I'm 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 convinced that when that comes to complete fruition, your background as a living historian in the film and all that will will may, make that 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 what you offer the public will be richer because of all those experiences. And so, yeah. Alex, having been a reenactor, when when you're doing the history teller stuff and a researcher, you're your shows with abs will be richer. Your shows individually will be richer because of that about Kate, the same thing. So what why why the the importance of this multi-center thing? So what what why how does living history work well and why does it work well? Let's bring Kate in because she hasn't said anything for a while. So <laughs> in, in Sorry. That kind of environment, yeah. Kate, <laughs> what is it that's special about living history? What what when it's work when it's firing all the cylinders, what how does it work get across the public in a way that other mediums don't? 
I've just been watching the chat, if I can just bring that in first, and looking at some of the comments about, um, like you're saying about multi-sensory and, and whatnot. Um, it's To me, it's getting it right, as best as we can, it's getting it right. And the fact you've got a live person in front of you, there's been a lot of people talking about, is this going to go to virtual reality? Are uh, we going to end up using, you know, holograms or so on and not actually having real people in fields, you know, arriving on a Friday night? going home on a Sunday having not showered. So you've definitely got the smell authentic type thing. Uh, I don't think that's the case because I think people still love watching something like this live. I can't call it theater, but what I do does have a, a dramatic element to it. Um, and it's seeing a, a, a person, not in a little box like we are now, a real live person. And if I'm doing that one, you showed the photo of the first aid nurse in Germany on a real horse, which might behave or it might not, it just brings a human element to it and humans love human stories. So that's me on a horse delivering a monologue. Um, sometimes she's great, sometimes the horse plays up and you've got to deal with that. And Alex- She probably um, said the same thing about you, Kate. <laughs> I know, oh, she's sick of it. She knows all the monologues. I know Alex watched me do one side saddle at Osborne once and the horse was a total nightmare and you've got to deal with it. Just like the person you're portraying would have done at the time. And I just think it's for me, it's that human aspect. It's being able to relate to somebody. Um, I put myself in a historical person's situation the best that I can do it through the research and the kit and everything else. Um, and I think that's what makes it important. And I love watching people's faces when I'm telling these stories. They nearly always have um, a fairly tragic element. And then what I do is open up to questions afterwards. So, what do I perform in character normally? And then take the applause if there is any um and then drop out of character go and talk to the audience answer their questions let them handle stuff pat the horse handle the stern gun and that's what makes the difference and then i can talk to them in a way that they can then relate to um the, the sensory thing yeah the, the horse smells the wet surge has got to be the favorite smell of all of us hasn't it um but getting that right, I noticed someone put something about dentistry a minute ago. <laughs> it's really important because everyone through history apparently had brilliant teeth um, because we never do anything about that. I've just recently joined a group called the Ragged Victorians and we have to make our teeth look decayed and we have to look like we've got dreadful diseases. Uh, so you can take it one way or you can take it the other. But there's an element of that that's really important, I think, in, in just getting it right and doing the best that you possibly can with it. And I assume, therefore, you've got feedback from teachers, from children, from people in the audience set. You know, the, the, the cliche would be, I've read a book, but seeing someone created in front of me was more meaningful, was more memorable. And, you know, and I said in the show last night that, that Mag and I went to the, the fairly new museum in Ypres. And, and, and the, the thing that we took away from was the kind of moving figures, the hologram type figures, rather than necessary things. I probably forgot what I read half an hour later, but things that, that fulfill that That's sensory... It thing they, they stay in your head and, and that's you me just hit the nail on the head i went to a museum on saturday and it was all text and i just went i can't i just can't be bothered reading this i'm just just not interested in reading this when i worked at the armories and, and i've worked at various other museums national army museum imperial war museums when they still use performers it made such a difference to have somebody walk out from the shadows or whatever it was and perform and tell a story and then they let the audience handle those objects and this is something i was going to throw into the mix here what you mentioned titles i don't know if you're going to come back to it i consider myself a historical interpreter purely because that's the term that was used when i started at the royal armories um in the last millennia and the thing with it was the armories were one of the first museums that had a dedicated team of professional performers with an interest in history who were honed into these uh, people who could go out and tell a story, who had handled the weapons, they'd shot the guns, we wore the armor, we wore the uniforms, we researched everything. You were not allowed on that stage until it was perfect. And uh, it's a relatively new thing, that's only 25 years ago. Um, so this, you're talking about the difference between good and bad as well. This is a, a relatively new thing in the world of living history to do what I do, as far as I'm aware. Um, and there's plenty of companies doing it now um, but it is fairly new on the stage uh, in, in terms of reenactment. 
and and we'll bring thank you and we'll bring Alex in a second. But already we've had a, a comment from Jonathan Bending there saying, "I agree, but I don't know how to watch when I see a fairly weighty lad wearing incorrect kit on the anniversary of D Day. I literally have no idea what the hell is going on." And that's the problem: is when it's done badly, you're not in the moment. You're not. You're not. The audience aren't captured by it. They're not feeling that 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 connection there. So Alex, as we said at the top of the show, you you know, you appear as a Russian cosmonaut one minute and a medieval jouster or whatever it would be, and then a first world war pilot. And, and you know, you're not, a, you're not a, you're not Russian. And that, so how, how do you, how do you accurately through storytelling use props and costume and living history to con con connect and, and how, how can you tell the difference between it working and it not working? What, what do you do to make sure it, it, it has that historical um, accuracy? Uh, well, obviously, as with any professional historian, the first stage is, you know, you research things. Um, and then as you research, certain answers will come to you. And that includes in the kit. So uh, as you're putting together a story, you say, oh, we need a, a hat for that person to wear. And so you start looking into what sort of hat that person would wear. And that leads you down another <laughs> angle. And then all of a sudden you get an understanding of, that person, the story, because somehow it's all linked up. You know, the, the people and the material culture of that time will change your understanding of whatever story it is. Now, sometimes with like the history teller stuff, it is the, the, the hat is a throwaway sort of sometimes it's overly big and floppy and it's purposely there for comic effect. Other times we put a lot of effort into uh, the type of goggles that we're wearing in a particular scene because goggles are important to that character or that uh, action. Uh, and so it, it can sort of really lend weight and credibility to what we're saying if we know what the kit is. Um, but going back to, you know, that person who you know, sees sort of the, the overweight person on D-Day or uh, a bit of what Taff was saying earlier, I think part of the problem is for some people, the, the reenacting is their hobby and it's not done for a public uh teaching perspective it's just done because they want to do it which is uh, you know brilliant i don't have any problem with that at all whereas we're all approaching it well certainly kate and i are approaching it i suppose taff with the museum approaching it from a, a, a teaching side we're trying to impart knowledge onto people and so it's not just about dressing up and having fun it's about how do we use this stuff to enhance what we're saying and so like i with the photography rather than just show victorian photos i could have easily just bought a load of photos off ebay and gone around saying this is a photo that was taken in the victorian period instead i decided to build the camera and buy the chemicals and learn how the process was done in 1850 because that would give me a lot more confidence and authority when i'm talking about photography because i've done it and i know sort of what it is and so sometimes the the material culture uh, is as much of the story as the historical facts you know knowing when somebody landed on a beach on what day is only a small part of the story to get the full story you need uh, a bit of context you need a bit of background you need sort of what came before what came after uh, and it's sort of all built and I think Part of that is understanding things like the kit. And uh, I mentioned earlier about the, the American Civil War march. One of the marches we did, you know, in hot weather and that sort of thing, 20 odd miles in a day. And at the end of it, um, one of our group was saying, well, I can completely understand why the army wouldn't just, you know, surrender because we've put all that effort to get here for the battle why would you just give up you, you, you know and his mindset was completely changed by the fact that he put all this effort into do something uh, in his mind that would give him you know benefit in the fight whereas somebody else is saying oh i'm so tired i could just crawl up under a bush and die and all of a sudden you you see that uh, these people would react differently in different situations to different you know activities and so it just it builds on the nuances you know it's very easy certainly in like regimental diaries it, people are listed as uh, numbers it's you know 20 people did this whereas if you spend time as one of those 20 all of a sudden those 20 people doing that activity it means a lot more 
to you as a, a, as a person and that's the, the smells the feels the you know digging a hole in in mud is not as easy as it's often made out because there are roots and there are rocks and all of a sudden digging a, a hole to hide in takes on a whole new meaning because you, you think well it took me hours to dig a hole and these guys are turning up and you know scratching out a hole with their bayonets uh, which you know is a really you know, difficult task and so all of a sudden it's given you that sort of level of understanding or level of sort of uh relatability to historical facts and figures that's a really good point though you made two points there before i bring taff in that i think we, about about historical knowledge in that you might have your typical military story, military historian who's trying to work out why a unit fell back or didn't advance on a particular day whether it's 1915 or, or 1943 whatever it is but the living historian knows that that ground there, he could dig a hole in 10 minutes. But this ground here, it took him five hours. So if he's taken five hours to dig a hole, he might be less inclined to leave it than if it's done 10 minutes and he can move and redeploy quickly. Now, the academic historian, I'm using that word not negative again, might not connect the dots in that. He might be looking at it purely on a kind of operational level, tactical thing, saying, I can't understand why that unit didn't move or did move. But the person who has dug the hole in that salient in that time would say they've just walked all that way to get there and they're not going anywhere for a while. They've dug that bloody hole and they're going to sit in it. You know, that's that's a, it's a level of extra level of information, the, la the layering we talked about that I think is the, the ultimate thing about what living history can bring is that little bit of perspective. So. Taff, I want to bring you in now about, yeah, well, you can a you can plug the Great War Huts project, but also you. World War One now is beyond 100 years now. So people are coming there. They haven't got a grandfather anymore. They haven't even got a great grandfather. So you fought in that war. It's becoming more and more distant. So you've got to convey <laughs> to people what it was like. People are coming there to a museum. Uh, your, uh, your background, living history, reenactment, khaki charms, film, how would will, will that experience be able to make a project of you educating the public better? I mean, one of the one of the things that got us with the idea that we wanted to do this was that over the years, we you know I, the, the thing that drove us, Kev and I, particularly and other chums, was that the version of history, the version of the First World War, that we were taught at school, was 180 degrees out from the version of the First World War that most of the veterans we met had, and there had to be something in that. Why is it that? with the exception of two veterans, including Harry Patch, all of the others said that the First World War was the best time of their lives. They all said that, that it was the best time of their lives. Was, what? That can't possibly be. Everything I've learned at school said it was dreadful. Every time the First World War is mentioned on the BBC News, even now, the words horror or slaughter or both will be in the first sentence, irrespective of whether it's a story about a horrific battle or about a cute cuddly teddy bear that someone brought home for his daughter. They don't say that about the Second World War, despite the fact that far more people die. So it's become this sort of, you know, this sort of image of the First World War has far outgrown the, the reality of it. So how do you redress this balance? And over the years, historians, people like Corelli Barnett, all those years ago in 1964, with the Great War series on the BBC, he firmly believed that television, the new medium, was going to be the way that we tell the masses. What he hadn't taken into consideration was the fact that most people who make television, directors, producers, script writers, commissioning editors, absolutely believe in the whole lines led by donkeys nonsense. And they still do. I work with the people every day of the week. We really do. It's That's how it is. And nope, not interested. You historians are just trying to flog books. Um, Gary Sheffield, on the other hand, Professor Gary Sheffield, believes that books are the answer. Well, to be honest, the problem with history books is that they're read by people who are interested in history and really not know other people. That's just a fact. The people who are listening to this tonight, uh, you all buy history books because you're interested in history. The chances of getting your great aunt to buy it or, you know, the kid next door is minimal. So one of the things that drove us to, to come up with, it, with, with with a visitor's centre, if you like, where we could attempt to redress the balance. where, and, and what we're very keen to do is to wind the clock back, because what got most of us into history as kids, uh, certainly people into the sort of the people who collected stuff, was going to museums that were full of things and stuff, real things, things that were there. 
Now, in so many museums now, all of that stuff's out the back. It's, it's in a store. They've replaced all the interesting stuff with touchscreen interactives. They've replaced it with lots of words and captions. A few months ago, Lindsay and I went up to Scotland and we went to one of the Scottish regimental museums at Edinburgh Castle. And you, as you went in the door, this huge, great wall full of words. And I have this irritating habit. Any museum I go into, whatever it is, I'll just stand around and just watch how people react and how they interact with it. And in 20 minutes, not a single person stopped and read any of the words that were on that wall until they got to a little display case. Oh, things and stuff and stopped and looked at it. Likewise, the touchscreen stuff. Oh, you have to have touchscreen stuff. It's got to be relevant for the kids. And the kids turn up and they go, this is not as good as my PlayStation or my phone. And they walk past it. The grown-ups turn up and go, I can't make this work. It doesn't work for anyone. Things and stuff will always appeal to people. Things that tell interesting stories. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to wind the clock back and go, right, we might be horribly surprised. It might be a dreadful mistake. But we are going to make the type of place that got us interested. And education, huge thing, education, no doubt about that at all. But the thing is that all of us went to school. When you went to school, you went to interesting places. But actually, most of the time, didn't give you a really burning interest in it, did it? I can remember going to, to York as an 11-year-old. Fantastic week. Loved every second of it. Didn't give me a burning passion for castles or Vikings. However, the people that go to museums, who keep going back to museums, are people early, retired, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, they're older people. And the people that go, if we're ever going to educate people and tell them a different version of history, we need to start with the really young and hope they grow up and remember it. Well, actually, you can turn that on its head. How about we tell people who are much older? Because they will tell other people. They'll come back again. They'll keep coming back. They'll tell other people. They'll tell the grandkids. And so what we intend to do is start at the top and work our way down. And of course, kids love it. We do school visits, uh, to be honest, during the whole pandemic, um, as the kids couldn't go to France and Belgium. Uh, we've had a lot of them come and do, and, and do a, a whole session uh, learning all about the uniforms and equipment, life of the soldier at Great War Huts. Then they go to our trenches and they learn all about life in the trenches. Um, so, so absolutely, we're doing all that too. But the age range, the, 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 the place that it's aimed will be specifically aimed at older people. So that, because in so many places you go to a museum now and you go, that, you know, I'm, I'm not learning anything here because it's all of it's been lowered down to this level and I'm not getting anything. Well, we're not going to do that. We're going to set the bar up here. And so that by the time you've, you've come out of it, you, you will hopefully have got something more out of it. The other problem that you have with the First World War is that it always becomes about dead blokes. It just does. Because if you're going to make it chronological, in the end, the war finishes. And despite the fact the British Army win this incredible victory in 1918, suddenly it's about symmetries, it's about memorials, it's about poppies, it's about dead blokes. It just is. That's got to be there. We get that. But what we're going to do, we're going to start with it. So you work in at the beginning. It's all about memorials. Well, I get this. I'm comfortable with this. It's about dead blokes. Then you can move past it. And then we can actually, you can learn stuff about the First World War. And it isn't going to be what we think is right, what you think is wrong. It's just about, right, here's all the facts. Work it out yourself. Because so far, as it's working at the moment, people every time people walk out of a building, I never knew that. Did you know that? I didn't know that. That's really interesting. And that's what we want. That's the way it needs to work. It's not, this is what you need to learn. It's like, oh, that's interesting. And, and they kind of learn it by osmosis. So so that's that's the way that we, you know, that, that's that's its purpose. That's That's what we're intending to do. And as you say, a lot of that is from years of experience of doing what we do, a lot of the ways that we're building stuff, certainly the trench system that we're building now, uh, a lot of the tricks of the trade there have been learned through years of film and television work. Um, so, so there's all sorts of levels there which uh, which, which are coming into play, um, which which will be coming useful for, for what we do. So, yeah. Cool. I mean, you say about, about the, the presenting of facts, but isn't it coming back to what we talked about at the beginning, which is about storytelling? It's about... It's about Give, getting across those facts in a way that actually tells a story that's engaging and, and connects with people. And, and this discussion about, we, we talked about there being good books and bad books, and there's been discussions in the sidebar about, you know, what would Taft do if someone comes to him with a crap story for a crap yeah. film? Would you do it anyway? And kind of, you know, that, that, that we can't do anything about that. But what we can do is talk about, in a sense, is is good good storytelling and bad storytelling. And there are good history books and bad history books. There are good reenactors and bad winners. There are good museums and bad museums. And it's all about conveying that, that story. And, and 
that should be what we should be discussing rather than saying that uh, people who write books are good and reenactors are bad. It's it's about the good of both of those aspects and the bad of the, both those aspects. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, any other one? Going, before we move on to a last point about what first person living is, Alex has got a point to, to continue this discussion. Yeah, it was so. just uh, coming off what you just said there. I mean, um, in the history tellers, we have a saying which is history is just good stories. Uh, we completely are on that. And we always see ourselves as sort of like the, the gateway drug of history. Uh, the way we often talk about it is that some history is dry, it's rather dull and boring. You have to wade through books. But if you want to learn and understand about it, you sort of do that. But it's getting that interest, that passion, like Taff said, finding that thing that interests you. Uh, years ago, uh, Abs and I at uh, Chalk Valley History Festival were doing a big interactive trench uh, experience where people sort of came through and met characters and all the rest of it. Uh, and we had one lady, she was in her late 80s, you know, and said, oh, her uh, her father had uh, fought in the First World War, but she knew nothing about it. Um, she came back to us sort of the following year and said, after seeing your presentation on the trench and all this sort of thing, that was the impetus for me to go away and learn to read about my father's experiences in the trenches and and she had a whole life when she could have done this but she'd chosen that moment because she'd been inspired and that's sort of what we see ourselves as part of rather than like saying good and bad history it's all sort of part of a spectrum we're we're part of the spectrum which gets people excited and interested whereas there are historians there who are doing the more in-depth detailed books which goes into specifics on a particular topic and people then can access that level of history which they're able to and they're interested in uh, and so i think like you just said it's not about good and bad and that sort of thing so much as people finding their level and their interests and using people like three on this panel or like the you know so-called academic ones uh, depending on what they can cope with and what their you know level of excitement will will get for them and there isn't necessarily a definitive way of getting across any of this history. I mean, Dr. Phil Blood has said that he kind of disagrees with Taft's vision of the, of the First World War, which is entirely legitimate. And I, I can't go back and find Phil. Oh, there it is. Phil Blood says they're not on the same page about the Great War, can't agree. And that's from direct academic research. Now, that doesn't mean Phil is right and Taft is wrong or Taft is right and Phil is wrong. It's two, it's two viewpoints from different directions that have drawn different conclusions about the same event, which... You, you could take five books about the SOE who 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 taught who have draw different conclusions from the same primary sources. That's 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 perfectly okay. It's long as you, I suppose as long as you stick to I, I think this and this the organization I'm with, the museum I'm with, the, I'm gonna tell the story this way because this is my interpretation. There's there's there are certain facts you can't get away from. A, a unit was mobilized on a certain date, they arrived in in, in France on a certain date and but an oral history can be interpreted in different ways. You can select different parts of it to, to, to support a different narrative. Um, you know, someone like Haig, I know we, we're World War II TV, but you can write all sorts of things about Haig. If you, if you take different quotations at different times, you can make it like, like we can with Montgomery in World War II. Uh, what, I think how are you trying to paint that person? I, I think that the, the, the First World War is different in that the Second World War, there's, uh, yes, of course, there's always, you know, there's always going to be new stuff to learn. There's always tweaks. There's always twists. There's always turns. But essentially, there is a a, a a kind of an established British narrative. There just is that says First World War was a bad war, that everybody gets killed for nothing. The generals are all idiots. It was all a total waste of time. And and, and that's we see that we I work with that every single day. And the people that that commission and make programs believe that the people that write newspaper articles believe that and the the fact is that the veterans didn't think that and their voice never gets heard and you could argue well it doesn't matter i'm an academic therefore i know these things but of course there are plenty of academics that obviously feel quite rightly his his research says one thing gary sheffield would would disagree with him and with um uh, pete simkins all sorts of others but the crucial thing is that if you're just going to say, well, tell you what, we're just going to let the mass of British public go, oh, it was all a waste of time, generals were all idiots, and just let that drift on, and everybody that fought in it, it was a waste of time, they all got killed for nothing. If you're saying, well, we're just going to let that happen, 
then fine. And you could say, I'm an academic. We're, we're doing this bit of research and this way. And did you know that this happened? That happened? And that's fine. Most people are never going to read it. They're just not. But what we know, if you tell somebody something they didn't know, if you challenge their perception, they will listen to you. And this is what TV guys never get. They tell the same story over and over and over again. They'll ring us up. Oh, we're doing this film, this little short film. Does it involve two blokes in a trench? How did you know? Because they all do. You tell the same story over and over and over again. Is someone going to get shot for cowardice? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they always do. And it's ridiculous. But the moment you say something that challenges their perception, and I'll tell you the one thing, above all else, if you say to them, did you know that 89% of British soldiers, sailors, airmen and women who went off to war came home? 89% of them came home. You literally see the double take. You hear the double take when you're talking to people on a radio interview because it's completely not what they expect. And academic historians will say, oh, yes, Tap, but you need to then quantify that. You need to then make the point that of that, this percentage were public school. No, no, you don't. Because the moment you decide you're going to quantify it, you're going to go into depth, you've lost them. The fact is you've hooked them with something they didn't know. And then they'll listen to you and tell them all sorts of other stuff. And we do this day in, day out. But the minute that you start to say, oh, no, we now need to go into depth, what you really need to do, you need to read my 10,000 word treatise, an article on it. No, no, they don't. You've got them hooked. Now tell them a bit more. And that's the thing. That's what living historians do at public events. They tell the public something that they didn't know and they just plant those little seeds. Alex and, and Abs, they tell those stories and people go away having learned stuff. Kate goes and does her stuff. People learn stuff they didn't know and then they might go and find a bit more. It's always about finding those little bits and pieces. It's doing a different job to academic historians. It's doing a different job to, to writers, to public historians. It's doing a different job to novelists. All of those people may well hook the public and get them interested in stuff and go off and do things but if you're just saying you know that that we should just well kind of ignore that because the research is most important it actually isn't changing people's perceptions making them think a bit harder making them think about stuff in a way that they'd never thought about it that's worth doing because otherwise we end up perpetuating this thing where television companies make the same film Theatre productions make the same film. Tomorrow we're sending stuff out for an advert. Exactly the same stuff about poor, hard done by fellas are all going to get killed. Because the people that make this stuff, that's their version of history and they no one ever challenges it with them. And it's dull. It's boring. It's tedious. It's the same old stuff. And actually, if you challenge it, then they might then go on and read your much more in-depth articles and books. <laughs> that, that's a really good point. Uh, we've, got, we've got things going on the sidebar now, which is fantastic. And yeah, the, you, I think the key thing is is to to make your audience, whether you're talking to a schoolroom or through the film or at an event like Alex's or Katie's at or me on a YouTube channel, is make people go away and think and investigate things more. If they if it just if they just nod along and agree with everything and just forget about it five minutes later, you you failed. If they're going away going, I didn't agree with that, and I want to prove that guy wrong by going, and that's great. If someone puts it, you know, ends a strip, one of my streams and goes, I think he and that expert got that wrong, and I'm determined to prove him wrong. Brilliant. That's better than just someone saying, Oh, it was great, but they've forgotten it five minutes later. And I'm gonna bring Kate in a minute because when I when I received Kate's book in the mail, uh, my previous ex my the recent experience I'd had with SOEs, I went to a lecture, I won't say where and by whom it was, but the lecture I went to, the talk was about SOE, but it didn't mention parachuting trying to kill people, being behind the lines, living off the land, being nervous about being caught because you're radio. But it was all about meetings, right? basically, MI5 saying that MI6. And I thought, how on earth can you take something as inherently exciting as being was working behind the lines and reduce it to a series of memos sent between Whitehall and... And when I got Kate's book, I was relieved immediately that there were talking, you know, talking about running around with pistols and stuff, because ultimately that's what's going to make me go from chapter one to chapter two. If it is just a regurgitation of the memos that were sent, I'll kind of go, oh, because I, I do this a lot now. And I get sent a lot of books and a lot of PDFs and some of them I lose the will to live by chapter 
I'm in fact, frankly, I'm half the, barely out of the forward sometimes. I want to go, oh my God. So lots of other great ones, by the way, folks. If you submitted a book to me, yours is probably one of the good ones. <laughs> I have received some bad ones. But Kate, it's storytelling, isn't it? Whether it's a museum, whether it's in public, whether it's by a book, it's the ability to tell a story. And that's where having, we will use the word dressing up, gives that ability. You, the, the, the pertinent fact you said about having a drama degree and a history degree is the perfect melding of that. So it's about storytelling, isn't it, Kate? Yes, it's exactly about <laughs> storytelling. It's really, really important. Um, <laughs> But earlier, it's people like people. Um, and quite often you get um, statistics or as Tuff was saying, you know, numbers, that 89% thing, I always get people looking at me going, I, I, really, have you just made that up? Are you trying to be controversial? Um, but for me, it's, it's taking those um, individual stories, finding a story that's interesting, that will open people's minds, that will encourage them to go and look into something. Alex's story about that lady in the trench is so lovely. And I've got a similar one with my SOE performance where somebody had never heard of SOE before. And he left me at Audley End that day, went on, did loads of studying himself and has now written um, a, a game all about SOE and is always coming back to me and saying, if I hadn't seen your show, I wouldn't have learned all those things and gone off uh, on my own avenue. Um, so it's taking what can be a dry history SOE is a little bit different um, because with the, the films about it, the, the ones made in the 50s and then later you've got Charlotte Grey and all that kind of stuff. There's this perception that it is all women running around with pistols, um, getting arrested, being tortured and executed. And I find it very important that you make sure that people understand that was only a, a, a percentage. Mm -hmm. It was it was only 30 um, percent. And I say only 30 advisedly because they thought it was going to be a lot more than that when they initially briefed the agents. And through my performance and hopefully through my experiences as a historical interpreter, it's kind of helped me write the book I did. There's a really nasty review on Amazon about the book, which is you can tell she's got a degree in drama because, uh, you know, she just makes it all up. And I thought, you, how dare you? And what I've done with that storytelling that's always been part of my life is hopefully bring these women's stories into a way that people will understand them, that you can empathise with them, you can put yourselves in that situation without making assumptions. I, I hate it when I read a book and say she thought this or she watched an insect on the blade of grass. How do you know? Don't, don't add nonsense to it. And I won't do that with my scripts. I will not add elements that are not there, um, especially if it's an eyewitness account script. I mean, sometimes you do have to sort of make things up. I've recently just written one about the Titanic, for example, and I've taken three accounts and put them all together, but made very sure that I haven't put anything in there that um, that isn't true, that wasn't felt by somebody. So, yes, it is. It's, it's storytelling all the way. And it's really, really important that people can just, for that few minutes, put themselves into that situation. Brilliant. Well, we might sort of bring up some kind of random things at the end, but the, the fifth question that perhaps seems a little bit less less exciting, but I want to get convey because you have to, we have talked about it is, and we can do this in kind of one line is what is first person living history? Because you know we've talked we've so we people have been asking us to make sure we kind of quantify some of these terms we had. You know, what is reenactment? What is living history? So, who wants to to start off with what is first person living? I guess Kate or Alex. Do you, do you, do you, well, we've just had Kate. Hey, Alex, you want what is first person living history? Um, so in the reenacting terms, first person would be uh, taking on the persona of somebody who was there in that time uh, and trying to stay within that time frame for whatever period you're doing an event. Uh, so the usual scenario is you take on the persona of a soldier in a particular regiment. You think about their background, their history, their life, and then you use that uh, research and that sort of uh, knowledge of that person, sometimes a real person, sometimes uh, a made up person, but based on sort of a real situation. And then hopefully your conversations, your actions, your thoughts will mirror those of the time period you're trying to reenact. And I think um, uh, this is one of those uh, sort of uh, areas where reenactment and living history and that, you know, it's sort of a blurred line. Whereas I personally think reenactment, reenacting is a, of a specific thing. So in you know, a specific battle, a specific yeah. event, 
Um, and so first person would be trying to put yourself in a specific situation, say, um, whereas living history is often a bit broader than that, where you're sort of just representing the time period rather than a, a very specific you know, action or something like that. So the first person is trying to become a person from a time period. And sometimes like Kate would do it as a, 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 a monologue talking in first person uh, about uh, a particular person from a story or whatever. Uh, and reenactors will do it as a try way of trying to put themselves into the time frame they're aiming for to try and sort of usually get a, a buzz, you know, a feeling of what it was like for that person, whatever time period they were in. Perfect. And Kate, anything to add on that about first no, person? I totally agree. Um, I don't, I've never considered myself a reenactor and it's not down to whether you're a hobbyist or whether you're a professional, I don't think. Like Alex said, reenacting is reenacting an event. So I can't go out and reenact a battle by myself. Um, that, that, to me, that's what reenacting is. You're reenacting a an event, uh, a, a period in time. I am I am just telling one person's story, or as I said, you know, I, I make it a composite. But I'm there as an individual, delivering a monologue in character, um, and then removing myself from that situation to be able to engage with the public. And I think that's really important. Actually, there are, or there were, a lot of historical interpreters who would only stay in character. And I found that very, very alienating. If you try to have a conversation with them, oh, I like your frock. Um, you know, oh, yes, it, it came from so-and-so's lady's maid. And you're thinking, actually, I'm just trying to have a normal conversation. And there is mm. that, like, it's, it's a completely different conversation there. So, you know, I've delivered training on it. I've been to training on it. What lines do you draw? But, yeah, I, I think it's very much that. Um, it's not necessarily the difference between hobby and professional. It's the way that you present it. To the audience perfect and i think that the thing i want to end with is it, we've been talking a lot about the the way of conveying history so so museums living history books academia education etc i think we've been talking about the public as if there's one type of public and in fact there's mm. multiple types of it because tav said something interesting that i'm going to kind of disagree with when he says a lot of my viewers read books now a lot of my viewers do read books but i also have equal number of viewers who don't read books at all. Now, that feels weird to me innately because I'm a book buyer. That's what I do. I'm 53 today, in fact, and that's what I do. I buy books. But some people don't. There's a whole group of people out there who use YouTube and podcasts as their only source of history. And there are people who read the kind of academic journals by people like uh, Taff mentioned Dr. Gary Shea, although he does do podcasts as, that as well, and maybe Dr. Philip Blood. And there are people who go to living history events, and, and, and there's an overlap, but they're not the same audiences. As Taff, you said earlier, some people who go to museums don't write, read books. Some people who read books don't go to museums. You know, I remember when I used to attend the Kirby Hall English Heritage event, there would be people who would park their deck chair by the arena and watch all the arena events, be it, you know, English Civil War, American Civil War, cannons, jousting, knights, and others who would never watch any of that stuff and would spend all their time with the people who are turning wood on a 17th century lathe. And, and some would try and do both, but there were different audiences, even going to a living history event. So maybe the question isn't about whether or not living history is good or bad. It's about identifying that living history is reaching an audience, a, a particular type of audience, and acad academic works are reading another audience. Popular history is perhaps overlapping the two. And that's that's the thing we're acknowledging is that a book aimed at a certain sector is trying to explain things differently to the kind of history tellers or Kate event or indeed the movies. People who go to watch Journey's End or whatever, they may not read books. That may be their only um um, access to World War One, and so whatever they 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 take away from that, that's the only information they get. So, to end things off, what's kind of people feel feeling about the audience? Is that have I kind of come up with something there about that, that the breakdown of audience? Alex, you're nodding there. I'll bring you in again. You're, you're muted. Hang on, muted. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, there is a wide variety of people. We in our history teller shows, we're always trying to sort of make it accessible to everyone so we'll say oh we've got to get that bit of fact in because that's a good bit of history but then we know we've got 
young kids. So we've got that fact in. Abs now has to hit me on the head with a frying pan because we've got to keep everyone engaged in the story as well as getting the history across. And I think you're completely right. Some people uh, will completely not understand what reenactors or living historians or, or any of that sort of stuff is, but will be fully in, on board with films or books or whatever. And I think, you know, coming a bit of what Taff said before about making making sure the films are good uh, or making sure the books are good, or if, as long as everything is, is imparting a little bit of correct and useful knowledge, I suppose that's helping get the point across uh, rather than assuming that once you've watched that film, you then have to read the book on it because that's the only way you can understand it properly. Uh, hopefully the film would be good enough to mean that you leave having learned a bit about the subject as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And and accepting the fact that all of us can can strive for a perfection that we can't achieve. You know, that's that, you know, I, I will make gaffes in my shows. I will get dates wrong. I'll forget names, things like that. And, and, and no matter how many times anyone proofreads a book, I've just got my new book. And, you know, I know there's going to be mistakes. I'm already reading a sentence. I don't like the sentence I put. I said, that sounds, that doesn't sound the way I, that wasn't how I intended it. It, it sounds like I've, anyway, so, you know, and living history, museums, films, you know, we can know we can never reach perfection. It's striving for some level of, of, of quality. But to bring things to an end, there are people who are watching this, and there'll be more who are watching it who have still got into this arms folded and and maybe even quite, you know, angry about living history reenactment. You've got kind of you're you're summing up now. Um any final words kind of make a making a case for 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 for, for wearing costume should we say so let's go to let's go to um the taff first for this one clowns wear costumes <laughs> um do you know i couldn't give a stuff i don't care what anybody <laughs> thinks i genuinely don't give a stuff over 30 odd years we've met some fantastic people we met some amazing veterans i don't think i ever met a veteran who had a problem with us um, especially once they'd had a chat, uh, and that was everything Canadian veterans at DF, uh, First War veterans, old contemptibles, um, you know, national servicemen, uh, and they were the ones that we, to be honest, we, we were always interested in meeting those. Um, and as a learning experience for us, the khaki chums were selfish. The chums was all about us learning. We, we didn't do much in the way of public displays. We often met the public on the highways and byways of France, Belgium, Holland, um we, we 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 always enjoyed it we make no no bones about that it was an enjoyable experience the thing that no, no one's touched on tonight which is the ultimate criticism of what we all do is there's no danger no one's ever going to get killed yep. and that's true that's absolutely true and but the first war veterans always had a saying which was 80 percent of the time we were bored stiff 19 percent of the time we were frozen stiff one percent of the time we were scared stiff now, 99% of that experience, you can experience in some form or other. You can get your head around. 1% of it, you don't need to. You don't want to. But a lot of that experience to have an understanding of it, because for most of any war, uh, a century ago, 200 years ago, right up to the present day, lengthy wars are about boredom more than anything else. They just are. We, we concentrate on the exciting bits, but actually the stuff that most people are really interested in, most ordinary people are interested in, where do you go to the loo? How do you sew your buttons on? Who sews your buttons on? Where do your letters come from? What do you eat? All of that stuff. That's the stuff that people are really interested in. Who digs your trenches for you? All of that stuff you can have an understanding of, you can learn, you can impart it. Um, and, and, and we've had a great time doing it. We've met some amazing people. We've, we've been involved in some fantastic projects. And we've worked with a lot of academic historians. And, and to be honest, an awful lot of them have treated me as an equal and have been happy to share knowledge and will even now ring me up and ask me stuff and say, look, Taff, no idea what this is. What's your interpretation of this? What do you make of this? Oh, I'm writing my book. There's no end of historians whose books I proofread for them to pick up the stuff that, that they've missed because... They they have no means of interpreting some of the stuff they're reading. So it does have a value. It really does. Um, but it does depend on whether you put your, your homework in in the first place, whether you do your research, how hard you're prepared to work at it, and whether you're prepared to, to reach a decent standard yourself in the first place. Because if you're not, then it's just a fun day out in fancy, fancy dress. 
Yeah, but and that and Marcus has made a point that maybe some of the resentment from outside of it is because you are having fun. It's because living history in Amman is fun, and and maybe you're not you know stuck in an archive feeling angry and frustrated and and finding it pressure. You are getting out there, going out and having camaraderie because we we haven't touched on this. There's another topic is that maybe academic historian is more of a solo. Thing, and whereas reenactment living history is more of a group thing, but we t- the people in Monty's Men yesterday talked about the fact it wasn't the spending time doing it; it was a spending time with people doing it, and and actually how they actually didn't like the events; they liked having achieved the events; they liked they liked having come out of it saying, "My God, I've done that march! I've spent three nights in a hole with only one night sleep between the three of them," and they didn't enjoy it; they enjoyed the camaraderie. So maybe some of the academic historians who are working tirelessly and brilliantly, but they're on their own a bit. They're in an archive. They're sitting, going, consulting papers. They're taking boxes out of the National Archives. And Kate's done some of that work, and you guys have done that sort of work. And, and they miss, they, they are kind of resentful that you're out there, you know, with your mates. That's that's maybe part of it. But let's bring um, um Kate in now. Then we'll go to Alex. And um, so, Kate, kind of final case for living history uh, or, or or dressing up costumes I, I've, I've used that word i'm gonna use it again just to press taps i'm, I'm using terminology the public would say that's the yeah i'm gonna disagree with what taff said in that i don't care i don't care what people think about it unfortunately i have to really care because it's my living so I need to put up a product that my client wants and then that they perceive that the public wants. And you, you know, people say, oh, I've got a brilliant idea for a character for you. And in my head, I'm thinking, that's really interesting, but I know it won't translate into a performance and therefore translate to the audience. So at the end of the day, and it's something uh, we haven't mentioned is we have clients, you know, we yeah. approach people, we get booked uh, to go to these events. And then it very much depends on how the public interact with us. Have we delivered what the client wants us to deliver? Have we ticked all the right boxes? I'm quite lucky at the moment and I I tick a lot of boxes uh, by being a woman. Um, But it really is important that your product is the very best that it can be so that the audience gets stuff out of it. um, And so your client does as well. Uh, The other thing is, yeah, I do get a kick out of what I do. And the hardest thing in the pandemic was clients were still saying, can you produce this material? And you're like, I'm sat in my spare room with a green screen behind me, trying to be enthusiastic, but I don't have that audience to bounce off. I don't have that reaction. I don't have that feeling coming back at me and making the films to start off with was a really lonely and difficult experience. The good thing about it is, is that I had a business to come back to. Um, that, that's one of the things we haven't really touched on. This is a business. This is my way of making my, my living. And it's it's got to translate in, in a certain number of ways to make sure that that can continue on. And also the simple fact that if it's your business and any one of you here are not good at it, you won't get work and you won't eat. So therefore, well, yes you know. and no, and it just depends what the client wants. You know, um, there are some years where we have very little and some years where we get loads. Um, I just wanted to come on to the camaraderie thing as well. Mm. I'm a I'm a one woman show. Uh, I'm most places. You got I your horse, Kate. You got the I horse. I sit in my study, and then you know you turn up an event. Oh, Alex and Abs are here. Brilliant, and we all go nutted to each other because you don't see each other for six months. Uh, we're in the same industry, but we don't necessarily see one another or know what one another's up to. Um, Abs and Alex do a show on SOE, which I didn't know about until they put it on. I was like, oh, that's amazing. But wouldn't it have been great maybe if we'd had been able to talk you know I, I don't know I could have offered help or research or anything not that they needed it because it's the most brilliant show and if they're doing it at Chalk Valley go and see it um, but there isn't that camaraderie you do very much work alone and then you, you rock up to these events and think oh god I hope this is I hope this is as good as it looks if I did it at home or when I put the uniform on in front of the mirror is it all as good as I hope it's going to be brilliant so Alex, um, we have you know, final words, kind of make a case for for, um, for, for putting the uniforms on. Uh, I'm sort of going to come down in the middle because uh, I can't really uh, fully sort of uh, make a case for reenacting because there's so much bad reenactment that I think brings a lot of bad things into the world of history. Um, some of it just bad, bad teaching, bad, you know, people get the wrong impression, all that sort of thing. A lot of that is 
reinforced by poor reenacting. But also it has things like it, it, it tends to glorify war quite a lot. Uh, and we're seeing like at the moment with Ukraine, war's not something to glorify in any way. Um, so it's not there to sort of reenactors who, who go out and say, oh, isn't this brilliant? Look at me running around my machine gun can sometimes be very inappropriate or just comes across as not a very good way of sort of teaching history or even learning about history you know, for them, you know, the reenactors themselves. However, on the flip side of that, I've learned a huge amount through reenacting and I know people who are huge uh, founts of knowledge on particular subjects because of their interest and they've followed it through through their reenacting. Um, and so I think it's sort of a, a, a big compromise that you, you do get some amazing stuff out of reenactors and reenacting, but you can also have an awful lot of quite damaging sort of aspect to it as well. Uh, and so I think um, reenacting probably uh, I, I couldn't make a case for and against. So I'd have to sit on the fence and say, you know, it, it would come down to a case by case uh, basis. Yeah. Sometimes it will really move everything forward. Other times it will just reinforce all the old stereotypes, all of the bad aspects uh, and do more damage than good. That that makes a really good point. And at, where, at some point when I allow people to come on and essentially do the rebuttal to this, I know that they're going to come armed with a good 10 or maybe more arguments that as a former being actor, I won't be able to. I will have to agree with them. I will have to say, yes, running around in a public field and people shooting machine guns at other people behind ba bales of hay is inherently silly and doesn't do anything, any anybody any good. And, is, and, and the whole access thing and the whole there'll be lots of points they can make that i will have to just agree with and that's that that's the it's not like we are there's no trial at the end of this we're not putting living history on trial and saying is it good or is it bad because it would be case dismissed not enough evidence would it, it would, there would be it would be a hung jury because we with yesterday and with today and the panel i've got on friday we are presenting in these three shows very much a glossy, shiny, good version of the right end, the proper end of the spectrum of what wearing uniforms are and clothing from the period is, and the other period, the other end of it, we can't, we can't defend that. There's not much we can say to defend that. You know, in my Taff and I's days, going back to years ago, you can't stop the people driving around an event in a in a in a in a 1950s Austin champ with World War II uniforms on and some, we can't stop that. We can't defend, we can't, I can't defend that. I guess you guys can't as well. So I think, well, Tap wants to say one, another point on that. But I mean, you don't need to defend it. I don't. Because you're no. not even talking about the same stuff. The thing with all of this is, it's like your fat wheezy bloke standing on the beach on the 6th of June. A, a bloke who just has an interest in it, who's bought his own kit, who's bought a ticket to France, who just wants to stand on the beach wearing that outfit, you know, that, that's not your responsibility. That's not my responsibility. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't share any of my values, presumably not yours or Alex or Kate's or, or those of most of the other people. But at the end of the day, as dear old Bill Abbott said to me, oh, sorry, Arthur Abbott, who, who was a first Suffolk veteran, who said to me, we, we were somewhere or other, and somebody was complaining, oh, Who's the, who are these people in uniform? And he said, my mates fought the Second World War so that they can do whatever they want. They have an absolute right. They're not doing anybody any harm. And it's all right by me. And to me, at the end of the day, I don't want to belong to a group of people in really badly fitting uniforms who do crap drill, who are an embarrassment to be seen with. But they have a right to do it. I don't have a right to stop them doing it. I certainly wouldn't invite them to come to Great War Huts and do whatever they do and do it badly. But but they have a right to enjoy themselves. If they want to turn up on a Saturday afternoon and fight some ridiculous football pitch battle with a load of fat, wheezy blokes dressed as Germans, that's up to them. It's not doing anybody any harm. It really isn't. And I think that that's the problem here, that, that, that to, to try and fit any of this into a little box that says, well, this is one thing, this is another thing. There's every single point on the spectrum here, from the blokes who've 
got long hair and wear a battle dress blouse because their dad wore one and they want to be in the right place. They want to be on Arnhem Bridge at that moment to the, the military vehicle groups who, to be honest, 30 odd years ago, this conversation wouldn't even be about reenactors. It would be about the military vehicle crowd with their yet green T-shirts and, and long hair and all that stuff. It just would. You know, what do you mean? You've got every single rivet right. You've got the right oil cans. You've got every single thing. You've got the right camouflage net and you look like a clown. White, white painted wheel nuts, Taff. It's white all about painted white painted nuts. wheel nuts. You know, you know the conversation. So in the end of the day, it's it, people just have a right to just do whatever they want in the same way that historians have a right to do what they want academic historians yeah. do what they want and all of it's fine that there's enough space in the world for us all to just do it and enjoy ourselves and some of us are lucky enough that we get to earn a living doing it yeah. and impart the knowledge that we've picked up along the way and some of you you know on your birthday are giving up the time to entertain people and, and give us all the chance to entertain talk about me it. on my birthday yeah i mean <laughs> this is the thing about it, it's great if and when I do a show where the rebattle happens, in a sense, it would be like having Peter Caddick Adams on, but not to talk about his book about D-Day, but to defend the shit books about D-Day. In the yeah. books, how, how yeah. does that work? You know. So, Peter, yeah. you've written this book, but I want you to defend this twelve-page book I bought in a souvenir stand in in, yeah. in Aramange. Yeah. And he goes, "Well, I can't defend that because I didn't write yeah. that." So, so, so the thing is, you, you don't need to defend it. There is no need for you to defend it. Yeah, to me, I'm happy to defend the right for anybody to do what they want, no matter how bad it is, because it's not affecting me. But I personally wouldn't want to do it any more than you would or, or most of the other yeah. people yeah. here. I, I would. I think I will do a show where people can put their rebuttals. It will just stand there yeah, alongside yeah, yeah. this for yeah. people to kind of look at it and go, they right. can watch it too and go, yep, I see that point. I agree with that. I agree yeah. what Kate said in the, pro yeah. in the professional yeah. show. I agreed what, let's say, it's Dr. Philip Blood said in here about, about it. I, that's, that's fine. You can... There's nuance. There's there's things in life that I'm not 100% definitive on. I kind of waver. And I go, well, I kind of, I mean, I, I'm broadly in that sense about reenactment because I've been talking about this. I, I live in Normandy, which along with Baston, possibly Albert, possibly Gettysburg, is the mecca of shit reenactment. And so <laughs> I see so much bullshit. Yeah. yeah, people in here who know me normally wait for my anger to build up because I start to see the people turning up with the. You know, voice. He's Woody's getting angry again. Woody's getting angry, again. and you know, and and I do, and I see it, and and I, I don't know how I quite deal with it, and it makes it harder to see the good stuff because you see so much yeah, bad stuff. Absolutely, and, and that, yeah, that's yeah. I think the point Alex is making making is that when you say Taff that we can't do anything about it, we can't. But the problem is if if P, if the public are seeing more of the shit than they're seeing the the good. It comes back this whole thing we started off. They're tiring everybody with the same brush. Yeah. They're seeing, yeah. they're see, but that again, we can't do anything about it, can we? We can't wrap yeah. it up I, for the the record, right, right. and not let them travel, can we? We can't have a. I can't go to Dover and stop them getting on ferries. I can't. Well, it'd be, yeah. it'd be Portsmouth. I, I agree with Taff in that people should be allowed to to do their bad reenactment if that's their hobby and their interest and that's how they access it. I'm not going to stop them. My worry is when that is then put across as a means of teaching about a subject that could be quite important or uh, could be uh, you know, relevant to a situation. When you're teaching badly, I think that is or potentially it's a problem when you're just doing a bad, you know, doing your hobby badly. That's just affecting you. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, with TAF, let people do their bad reenactment. That's no different to people playing bad football, say. Mm. But um, when it comes to trying to impart that knowledge to a public who is often getting very misleading stuff like Taff said with the, uh, the the greatest hits of history you know the, the trenches and the mud and the, the whatever it is that, that always gets regurgitated to fight against that you need to then put across the the better historians the better reenactors the better sort of quality uh, and that I think is where my issue lies is that people mm. doing it badly is not the problem but putting it across as teaching I think can be dangerous in you know it's thin end of the wedge i suppose yeah but i mean we're, we're stuck with the tropes we're stuck with the thing i mean i you know i i one of the things i'm always asked to do is is sort of about podcasts is about the 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 omaha beach being a tragedy and when i say to people omaha beach wasn't a tragedy it was a well that well fought landing that started badly people think i'm 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 crazy and you go well, it, it, it wasn't a tragedy. That's the, it, like what Tav says about you have to use the word horror when it comes to the trenches. 
Omaha Beach, you have to have tragedy or disaster now. And then you go, but it wasn't a disaster. It was a, it was the first bit was a bit shit, absolutely a bit shit. But by by the rest of the end of the day, it was a successful landing. And but we can only chip away at these tropes. We can't yeah. change it. Yeah. All we can do is do it. Comes down to how we start. It's what we can only do. What we do. Kate can only go out and do her shows the way she does it and write her books and do her presentations to the best of her ability. And so can Alex and so can Taff with his films and me with my channel. We cannot police the others. There's there's nothing. We we can only try and set a bar high enough that maybe by kind of osmosis, we inspire people to raise their standard. If if people think what we're doing is better, then people might want to be a, reach a higher standard. I don't know. Well, but, I think that's true. I, I do think that's true because... During lockdown, when we got nothing better to do, we did a whole series of what we called Hutted Histories, which were just online chats. And a couple of those were, 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 were challenging myths. You know, it was a, sort of a, an hour's worth of just challenging myths. And what was lovely was there were quite a lot of living history guys, especially people that go into schools and do talks, who were getting in touch saying, I've really learned something interesting. That's fascinating. It's really, would you mind if I use that? You know, of course, you're very, very welcome. So the people that actually do want to, uh, are keen to learn and, and are keen to to start sort of teaching stuff properly. Um, the decent people are going to start latching onto that if that information's available somewhere. So, so absolutely chipping yeah. away, absolutely. But the more you keep chipping away, the the more the more impact you make. Definitely. So, any final points anyone wants to make? Or should we bring this to an end? Kate said, "I think we're done then." So. Well, I'll just remind people what we've got coming up and I'll, I'll come back and say goodbye to you folks in a minute. So um, nothing tomorrow. I've got a day off tomorrow. And Friday, we've got another aspect of living history, which is kind of people who are outside of it, but talk about it. So my other guest, Jonathan Ruffle, has done writing uh, radio shows. He's also commentated at events. So he's seen living history. We've got Marcel, who has... Um, uh, been a photographer and does work with museums in terms of using reenactors to create imagery and displays. And John, who is in America, who works at the US Marine Corps Museum, who has again used living historians reenactment to enhance his displays. So this is now the next part that will kind of explain that aspect of it there. Uh, so as usual, folks, the links to everybody's websites these are in the description below. So Alex's websites, Kate's website, website uh, Khaki uh, Devils, all in the description below. Some of these people have other things on YouTube. As I say, Taff mentioned his, his Great War chats. You can find all sorts of things there. Them on Twitter. So all of that is in the description below. Uh, as usual, if you're new to the channel, click like, click subscribe, consider becoming a patron or a member of the channel. And above all, keep challenging yourself. Keep keep taking what we've said tonight and and if you think you're you're we're wrong about something challenge us uh, uh, go out there do your work and and don't just stop keep on learning so that's it uh thank you taff thank you kate thank you alex it's been a pleasure talking to you and um i'm actually back in the in um in essex uh, a couple of weeks time taff so maybe i could pop up to it switch for a pint you're very welcome right? um very brilliant well. Cheers. So thanks, everybody. This is Paul Ward for World War II TV saying I will see you all again on Friday. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching and thanks for your wonderful sidebar, which I will go back and read later on when I've had a beer or two. Cheers, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Bye.